There is no value in being rough, tough, hard, and just mean. <laughs> Easy. It's just being a bad human being uh, to follow that. So kind, empathetic, understanding must be part of the equation. At the end of the day, whatever we do, we must be human and humane. It is great to be in your company. I'm your host, Lennox Wasara. An award-winning radio presenter, it's been a long journey and this episode is our final episode for the year 2021. Thank you for listening and for your continued support. University of Pretoria's law program was ranked first in South Africa and Africa and 60th in the world. The institution's veterinary science program was ranked first in South Africa and the continent. With this being the fifth consecutive year that UP's programs have held this position, the law program's performance is an important one and improvement from being ranked in the 100 and 125 band over the years. Not only is UP exceptional in the academic arena, UP continues the winning culture in sport with the likes of a new world record in swimming, the Varsity Cup champions, amongst others. Join me on this podcast as we speak to a number of alumni guests who continue to share their insights, their lessons, and most importantly, share how you and I can become a force for positive change in our space of influence. In this episode, I'll be speaking to Professor Tawana Kupe. Professor Tawana Kupe is a 13th Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria. He took over the role in January 2019. He holds a Master's degree in English from the University of Zimbabwe and a PhD in Media Studies from the University of Oslo in Norway. Prof is enthusiastic about higher education, media, and knowledge creation. In my previous engagements with Professor Cooper, I quickly noted that he has a sense of humor, and every time that our parts do cross, I typically enjoy a giggle or two. Have a listen to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Tawana Kupe. Uh, Professor Tawana Kupe, thank you so much for joining us today on the Lead of You podcast. It's great to uh, have you on this episode. Yeah, no, I'm glad to be here. So I was here at the beginning, before the very first one. Yeah, yeah. We did the promise. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> Incredible. Uh, Prof, I mean, a lot of students, a lot of alumni, some people actually come to the university, never actually get to meet the vice chancellor. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are very curious as to what does a day look like in the vice chancellor's life? <laughs> it's very busy. <laughs> there are meetings all of the time. Yeah. Uh, with individual people, groups of people. Then there are events all of the time. So it's like that from meeting, single person groups of people, an event, conference to open, conference to address, some paperwork to sign, things to read. And it's like that. And also meetings with overseas people like today, at between one and two, I and my counterpart at Leeds University met with our teams to discuss some collaboration going forward. Yeah. Wow. Then I had a recording for a dinner speech for the people have graduated under the Nation, National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences. Sure. Now I'm here. <laughs> yeah. And there's probably a lot more happening after this as well. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, indeed. One gets a sense that uh, the, the, the role almost feels like, you know, when a, an ambassador is in another country, the sort of the president of that country, you know, mm -hmm. representing the country, and then, you know, the vice chancellor almost feels like the president of the university. Well, yeah, yeah, yes, no. In fact, in the job description, one of it is to represent the university. And that representation can be here now in this uh, room where you're recording this, or it could be in a foreign country somewhere. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, Prof, throughout the year, we've seen uh, you sharing the graphics of the LeadUP podcast. I've seen you on Instagram very actively sharing on LinkedIn. I've seen you sharing a lot of those. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you in multiple conversations uh, talking a lot about the LeadUP podcast, just mm -hmm. uh, directing people there. Mm -hmm. I definitely know you've been listening to it. Mm -hmm. And just your overall feeling about the podcast, and perhaps you might even have one that's your favorite episode. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely, I think one of the best things we have ever done. And also remember the podcast is an offshoot of our uh, panel debates the where we started the lead UP brand if you like now in the podcast it's uh, taken it to another level because people can listen at their own time now you see about your question about which one is my favorite it's difficult to say <laughs> and not because I'm afraid of offending anyone alumni it's because the people in there remember are very different and they've done also leading alumni so it's, uh, you can, each is unique and I like different things about the people 
almost half or more who I have met either in person or through the online discussions, either on the on those panel debates or or actually on an online meeting. Indeed. Yeah. So um, each is unique and each is my favorite. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. All of them are your favorite. Yeah. Uh, that's good to know. This is obviously the grand finale episode of the Lead to Be podcast for 2021. We've had a plethora of uh, guests who have joined us on this podcast. And in this podcast, where we're featuring you is because we're actually getting the different voices from the different guests who have, who have come on. Mm -hmm. They've said some truly uh, insightful things at some point, and we're literally extracting that conversation, and then we want to sort of get a reaction from you. So that's what we'll be hearing from our vice chancellor, more of a reaction uh, from the different conversations. The first one is uh, Tailo Mojapolo, who is the CEO of BP Southern Africa. Now, a fun fact about Tailo Mojapolo, she's the second black woman to head a multinational mm. uh, company in the gas and oil industry in South Africa. Here's an extract from my conversation with Tailo. You know, I always say, we spend quite a bit of our lives going through understanding the what. So, you know, you've got the, you know, what, how, why, or if you want to start the other way, you've got the why, the how, and the what. And it dawned on me a couple of years back that I probably needed to spend quite a bit of time just trying to articulate my purpose. So I took some time out doing a lot of self-introspection. And the way I articulate my purpose, my why, is to uplift other women and groom better men. What does that mean? It sounds like a slogan. I always say that to myself in my mind so that I'm very conscious in everything that I do. And what motivates me, I get a lot of energy from making sure that I use the agency that I have to uplift those that are more vulnerable. Not everybody has the courage to have a voice. And how do some of us that have that agency enable them particularly in the workplace, to be able to speak out, to lean in and to be themselves. But also those that are probably in a position of power, how do I allow them to let their guards down, bring in a bit of vulnerability in order for them to be a lot more inclusive? Prof, when it comes to identifying your motivation, your purpose, in other words, your why, as she put it, mm. uh, what would you say is your why? To make a difference. That's what I believe, because I believe that education and knowledge make a difference. And so I'm in this to make a difference using knowledge and education, because I think that is hugely transformative and also in both visible and invisible ways. Invisible ways to see a person graduate and realize their potential, you know, is an affirmation of what education can do. But then also what that person goes on to do to Im impact others. It's invisible. You all know it every day. We know about uh, uh, dialogue because we did a podcast on it, but there's so many thousands of alumni doing the same and impacting situations. And we know, and I know, being vice chancellor and having a university makes a difference. Indeed. That's very important. Uh, knowledge creation mm -hmm. at the helm of, you know, what you just articulated, yeah. making a difference. But how does it feel to know that, I mean, you've been vice chancellor since 2019. You've been yeah. making a difference for a long time at the University of Pretoria and before that. So yeah. um, how does it actually feel for you to know that you are actually achieving your quote unquote, your why? No, for quite satisfying because you could have a meaningless, pointless, directionless life, <laughs> if you know what I mean. But if you keep at it, you are resilient even when it appears difficult. You soon realize that what you do matters and you must put all your energy into it and you begin to enjoy it and you feel quite contented. Yeah, true. It echoes that uh, famous quote, make today matter. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, Prof, over to our second uh, extract. This is uh, Nicole for him. I enjoyed speaking with him. He's a CEO of Creative Solutions. And a fun fact about him, he is the technical Oscar winner um, that he won uh, this year. And uh, let's play the extract from my conversation with Nicol. So we spoke briefly before the call about what, what is leadership. And, and there's lots of different definitions. It means different things to different people. Um, what I found and what I made my own definition is there's, there's two aspects to it. There's the leader that is typically someone that motivates people, um, inspire them, 
and and it's running kind of right in front you know when you're running up that mountain the leader is in front and then there's also a manager and the manager is someone that's more organized and more disciplined and more structured and has to pay attention to all these details because it's not only the vision that matters it ve it's very much the execution i think it was General MacArthur or somebody that says, if I had to choose between a good strategy and good execution, I'll take execution every day. Because even if you have a great strategy, if you have poor execution, you will fail. So what I found, what came easy to me and what I was maybe more talented in was the leadership side of it, not the management side of it. I'm, I'm not a naturally a very organized, very disciplined person that, very structured um I, I kind of that actually scares me i hate structure but i can in, i can excite people i can motivate people i can convince people so it boiled down to i had to just find a vision and convince people that this vision is worth pursuing it's worth running up this hill but then i also had to find other people that can help me um, that can offset that weaknesses of mine where I'm maybe not so structured and not so disciplined. So I've, I always surrounded myself with people that are strong in the areas that I'm weak. So I think what's maybe the most important thing for any leadership position is having that maturity, that EQ, the emotional coefficient, to know what your weaknesses are. If you know what your weaknesses are, then you can actually address them you can either try and grow as a as a person and get better at your weaknesses, or you can just find someone to help you to offset your weaknesses. The, the, the danger lies in only focusing on what you're good at and not recognizing what you're weak at. I, I wonder, Prof, uh, from your uh, listening to that, I immediately think about just how important it is for leaders to be aware of their weaknesses. Mm. And this gets me to think about perhaps in your journey, you've had times where you've had to identify some of your weaknesses and I wonder how you went about that process. No, the reflection is very, very important. And where you feel that uh, despite all of your strengths, you are not firing on all cylinders. That's when you have to think what your weaknesses are. And also oftentimes you actually feel rather ill or you see this, you're all even somewhat overwhelmed. So if you reflect on it, uh, for me, it was like I could realize I was working way too much and not taking enough rest, working through seven days a week. So on reflection now, I try and have a single day where I don't work. <laughs> no. And But you're still reflecting at the back, but you are not actually, in a sense, again, deep in the, in the nature of work. So... And then also pursuing your hobbies. So if you are wicked pursuing your hobbies, you're likely going to run out of energy, steam, and enthusiasm. So your hobbies and the things that you're interested in actually fire you up for the work and give you that ability to deep reflect or on the background reflect, but enjoy, re-energize, and renew. Yeah, that's true. And this time of the year, a lot of people are looking to rest mm -hmm. and reflect mm -hmm. on the year. Uh, which is uh, what you've mentioned, but also gets me thinking about what is the best way to respond to negative feedback? Because sometimes, I guess some of those weaknesses might be verbalized by other people in, mm -hmm. uh, via feedback, and that feedback is negative. Mm -hmm. uh, from people around us in our professional environment, be it our family, how should we actually respond to negative feedback? Mm, deep breath. Take a deep breath. And then weigh it up as well. Because some feedback might actually not be you know, accurate, but do not just dismiss it. Again, you know, think about it and say, might this actually be true or to what extent it is true? And that is why the deep breath and the reflective exercise and the weighing up makes sense. Because then in a sense, you're able to weigh how much of it you should really, should really push you towards change and how much of it you might actually say not it, but uh, move on. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And talking about that, I think um, it, it certainly does make a lot of sense having a sense of discernment as to, yeah. you know, the, the voice sort of articulating yes, your weaknesses. Yes, yes. Um, to what extent does one determine or, you know, weigh up in discerning 
from the person giving you the feedback. Perhaps, you know, you look at the person, have they walked the road before? Are they just talking the talk? You know, what do you Yeah, yeah, at? yeah. No, I think that's important is where, where is this person coming from and what is their intention? If they are coming from, like you rightly say, having walked the same road, or on the other hand, being a person who's very supportive of you and admiring of what you actually do. They're coming from a bad place because they actually want you to strengthen your strengths, if I might put it that way, and weaken your weaknesses, <laughs> if you yeah. want to put it that way. So, so, and also whether a person is also coming from sheer envy and jealousy and a destructive mo <laughs> moment, they might not be completely wrong, but you must weigh it up and, and calibrate accordingly. So yes, where a person is coming from their motivation and the relationship you have and relationship they have to what you do is important in that discernment. Yeah. I'm tempted to ask, when we flip the coin now, you're the one giving the uh, negative feedback. How has that gone for you? Is there a moment maybe that comes to mind where you've had to actually be the one giving the negative feedback mm, yeah. uh, to a particular, maybe a colleague or... Yeah, in my role, you know, it's part of <laughs> the things that you have to do. Not the best thing you, you have to do. But again, if you want your feedback to be taken well, if you like, and for a person to understand it and be better inclined to, to change and address their weaknesses, you also, how you say it, when you say it, becomes very, very important. Because that's why I say that where, is it, where a person is coming from matters quite a lot in you know, dealing with matters of weaknesses here. Indeed. To our next um, extract from the podcast, it, this person is, uh, we actually went to their office, Prof, it was mm -hmm. uh, very fascinating for us because uh, it's uh, one of the tallest buildings in Madrid. Mm -hmm. uh, this was Dion Chango, he's the CEO of PricewaterhouseCoopers Africa. Uh, he's the first black CEO for PricewaterhouseCoopers Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, here's what he had to say. What a privilege to be given such a responsibility um, to lead, right? Leading is not a right. Um, leading is a privilege and it's a fantastic opportunity for anyone. But you're absolutely right. Leadership is all about creating the right culture. Um, and culture inherently is probably one of the most difficult things uh, to land or to master, right? Uh, culture for me is all about inspiring people to consistently exhibit the same or similar behaviors all of the time. Um, and you know how challenging it can be to work with people. So a lot of that culture really has to come from how we as a leadership team um, hold ourselves up to those whom we are asked to lead, right? Um, and this is where concepts such as servant leadership come to mind, where it, it becomes incredibly important for you as a leader um, to be as authentic as what you can be, to be open, to be transparent, and to be as honest as what you can be all of the time. Um, and, you know, if, if you don't demonstrate that authenticity, uh, people see through that very quickly. A very interesting uh, thoughts from Dion. And uh, you've led multiple teams before, and you're currently at the helm of the leading institution in Africa. Mm. Uh, our law faculty did very well recently, becoming you know the best in, in, in South Africa, the best in Africa and uh, in the top uh, 60 in the world. Mm. So truly incredible. But he experiences leadership to be a privilege. What ways have you experienced leadership to be a privilege? And if they, if it is that case, then what aspects of it have made it feel that way for you? Hmm. Well, for, for status, you know, many other people could have done, been handed the role and done better than you. So it's a privilege that you were chosen <laughs> because often there, there are others that could also have done it. But at that moment in time, the role was given to you. So it's a privilege. So if some, for, I always say to those who have privilege, more is expected of them. Because imagine that some others could have been given the role and even arguably done better than you. And you act like, no, the privilege is just yours. And then you do, do not put in more. You are disappointing not only those who chose you among others, but also you are squandering an opportunity actually to be even be better than yourself. To because of that privilege, 
do as well, if not better than the others who could also have been chosen in that role. So it's a, a, a privilege, is a, is a responsibility as well. Yeah. Uh, there's a sense of many people when there is an opportunity to level up in their career, mm. uh, realizing how much more responsibility that comes with than a sense mm. to shy away from it. What, what do you do to actually embrace that responsibility? Because I imagine when you took over the role, you must have had to be like, okay, okay, this is going to be big. Uh, I wonder how uh, people can sort of embrace the responsibilities that come, uh, be, you know, when they get new opportunities. Mm-hmm, yeah. At the risk of uh, repeating myself, I think making a difference when you get that, you must be excited that if you take the role and the responsibility, you are going to make a difference. And that difference will be very clear on the ground. So, and for me, it's it's more, I'm not uh, more reluctant about the responsibility. What I, once I choose that I would like to be considered for the role and responsibility. And then and it excites me. Once I'm excited, then it drives me. It's, there's no doubt. <laughs> yeah. that is, it's about how I'm going to do it and how I'm going to achieve that difference, working together with, with others as well. So I think that it's always... Do not take it if you are not going to be excited and if you don't think you'll make a, a difference. And if you think, because once you get it, it's a little over for you. <laughs> you have benefited. <laughs> now, what are you going to, what value aid are you going to bring from your benefit? <laughs> and and also, do you have the excitement? Do you have the energy? It comes from there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah indeed. Mm-hmm. Um, to that, uh, last thought though, is that uh, some people might take the responsibility. Some people might get excited, but the little word that's been going around around COVID-19 is burnout. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, doesn't that sort of get into the conversation at some point, maybe three, four, five, six years later into a particular role? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't know if you've experienced any of that. Mm, no, well, I've never gone beyond exactly more like more than seven years. <laughs> yeah. So yes, no, but after a long time also, you might want a different role. It might be higher or sideways. In one of my previous roles, I had done it uh, six, seven years, I think. I thought that I should take a different role, not higher, mm. but more. Some would consider it lower, but I don't consider, for example, me returning to a teaching and research role as lower because that is what a university does. But some people have to do the the administration and the management. It happened to be me at the time. If I were to return to class, and teaching to say students is not lower. It's a, it's, it's dark or it's a different kind of. So there was a time when I thought, no, now I should return back to where I started, you know, which is teaching in the class and doing research and writing books yeah, 24 hours a day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Um, almost like, you know, sidestepping in rugby, just mm-hmm. moving to the side. Mm-hmm. Indeed. To the next extract in, in the conversations we've had, uh, Leandri van der Vaart. She is uh, the lead product development engineer at L'Oreal International. She is out in Paris. She actually moved to Paris for the role. Actually got hired when uh, the company was in a hiring freeze, but they were so impressed by her, they actually mm-hmm. roped her into the company. Uh, and uh, interesting fact about her, she was second placed in the MasterChef South Africa season two. So uh, mm-hmm. She also has a cookbook as well. So is, yeah, yeah. This is doing exceptionally well. Mm-hmm. Um, let's have a listen to what Leandri had to say. I think that there's a there's a trend coming. Um, you know, when it comes to responsible business, um, there are so many organisations that are becoming uh, B cause. Um, you know, signing agreements and joining roundtables where they promise to do good. And I think that this is the the call of our generation is that um, this obsession we have with growth uh, you know is is unsustainable and we're seeing the the fractures in in our climates in our societies um, uh, and in our health you know because of this obsession that we have with growth and so I think for sure uh, the, the leaders of the future need to be empathetic not just towards one another and people in their teams but towards the planet um, and, and towards themselves in a way, I guess that's not called empathy, but um, they need to be kind towards themselves because we need to start rethinking how, how we build businesses and what we define as success. I mean, uh, I, I think it benefits your team directly if you're an empathetic leader, of course, because people feel more seen, they feel valued, they feel understood, and they feel as though you you want to see them grow, you want to see them develop, and you want to see them, um, yeah, achieve their goals. Um, But beyond that, as I said, I think we could start having empathy towards um, 
yeah, towards the planet and um, uh, rethinking how we take and how we give back to it. Uh, Prof, it's quite clear that there is a somewhat a sense, I guess, some people have that when you if somebody is a kind and empathetic leader, it's almost perceived as though it's a softer or a more fluffy style of leading, which in essence, you know, probably isn't. But your views and your your thoughts around kind and empathetic leaders? Yeah, it's I think that being a, there is no value in being rough, tough, hard, and just mean. <laughs> it isn't. It's just being a bad human being to follow that. So kind, empathetic, understanding must be part of the equation. So, so yes, people must be held accountable for what they do not do or not, and, and, and be asked to pull up their socks. But the doing it that way does not, is not to the exclusion of being kind or empathetic. So if you like, it's a mix, you know, and also that builds people, that is being human. At the end of the day, whatever we do, we must be human and humane. And, and and that will actually, in a sense, you get the best out of people in that particular way. Because there is a limit to meanness, roughness, and hardness. And people might simply say, I'll do the minimum that I can, or, or simply be, you know, insolent and so on in, in both visible and invisible ways. And there's nothing you can do about that. People also want to be, I think what she was also saying, people also want to feel valued for the contributions that they make. Mm. Indeed. Um, Prof, also just thinking now, I guess, um, talking about the whole idea of uh, kind and being empathetic, mm. um, COVID-19 has forced many people and many organizations and businesses to think deeper about that aspect of things. Mm. Um, from your experience, are there any moments that you've had where you've had to deliberately show that to uh, your personnel over the years? Yeah, I think during at the beginning of COVID and also almost throughout my monthly uh, uh, communications or communications after, you know, COVID levels were lowered down, I did express that very strongly that I understood the mental and other pressures that were on people and that the mental health and physic, even physical well-being of people are being affected by the situation and that that... Uh, I was with, with them on that on that score and what we could do and what services we we're offering to both staff and students. So we ramped up our mental wellness programs, for example, even including some that are online. Scooby is a great example, which is an AI-driven application to actually assist people on, and then also built up more of the, uh, allowed more of the PA group uh, support measures on WhatsApp groups and others partnership with Sandak, South African Depression and Anxiety. So you have to articulate that you know what people are going through and therefore what they can do because people also want to be empowered. You can't simply say things will be done for you, yeah, yeah. but also what things can be done for them and between what they can do themselves and what things can be done from them, there is a space for, you know, navigating the situation differently. So in our previous conversation uh, about a month ago, uh, we were addressing students' issues and questions around COVID-19 and coming back to campus. Mm. And one of the things you mentioned in that conversation we had was that, you know, people must have a sense of, uh, they must uh, show a sense of, they must have a bit of leeway with yeah. the students, you know, and show a bit of empathy. Yeah. So that's uh, another example that yeah. I've seen you demonstrate, you know, yeah. you know, yeah. encouraging lecturers to actually, yeah. uh, you know, just show that bit of empathy and kindness. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's very, very important because... When I'm teaching people, it's also building people. And also, if you're building people, you have to show that em empathetic dimension. You don't build people by simply being very straight to the rule, mean, and so on. Where there is leeway, it must be exercised. Indeed. Mm. Um, and also, the University of Pretoria is uh, the biggest producer of research in South Africa, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a phenomenal achievement. Mm -hmm. And you've spoken a bit at, at length as well about research not only having impact, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in the top journals, but also having local impact in communities, changing mm -hmm. lives and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, which again does touch to the angle of empathy and yeah. kindness to those within the yeah. environment, the universities. Yeah. It's also what we call uh, social responsiveness. To, to local and global uh, challenges. It's, it's because, you see, there are two forms of impact. Is the metrics used to measure quality, top channels, rankings, and all of that. Yeah. 
that I think is is a way of trying to ensure that what we produce is of a certain quality and a certain standard, if you like. But that's not sufficient. Then what? If it's of if you've measured that it's a certain quality is internationally comparable, the your next challenge is, but does it make a difference on the ground? And also if you can answer affirmatively in that, then that is real impact. Because you've demonstrated that using your knowledge, skills, and all of that to teach people to do research, you can be the best you can ever find elsewhere. But you've taken that step to say, well, what we really exist for is making a difference in people's lives. Now, addressing all of the things that you could, restoring, hearing, if you, as one of our professors did, trying to create and creating sustainable food security, doing research and recommending good nutrition, building better roads, you know, using technologies to, I mean, sometime this week or next week, we launch our next, our third robot employee. Okay. We have one in health sciences, we have one in the library. Libby and Stevie will have a, a sibling okay. soon <laughs> at Engineering 4.0. And they, those, uh, the, the complementarity between human beings and technology, they're working in a sense to be responsive to situations and bettering how we do or do things, if, if, if you like. So social impact or impact uh, uh, is understood from the human angle, not just from the metrics or measuring research or measuring teaching effectiveness of teaching for that matter is, is what really we are about. If you are not doing that, then... You know, you are just trying to tell people you are very good at something, but what are you good for? Yeah. I'm good at, but what are you good for? As Chris Spring says in his uh, book, The Soul of the University, when mm. excellence is not enough. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and talking about books, Mark, are there any other books that you enjoy outside of uh, academic journals and maybe some books that you've uh, read? Yeah, you know, I like biographies of many different people, writers, politicians, statesmen, you know, people have made just, yeah, yeah, and it led interesting lives that had a good impact on others. So I also like reading fiction. I like reading also books on, on you know, technology, theoretical books as well, philosophical books as well. The late Christoph Haynes gave me a book oh. called The Humanist. I forget the title, the author right now. But it's a very interesting book about you know, being humane and humane, yeah. 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 I saw a photo you posted once. I think it was on Instagram. You were in your, I think, your house, and there was a whole library of books and <laughs> oh, and, and, and a ladder, and you're telling about how you spent so much time in there. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well, I had to climb a ladder because the bookshop hangs <laughs> hangs on <laughs> a bit high up on the roof. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, incredible. Uh, to our final question, uh, it's really a compilation of various guests on the podcast. We've had obviously this uh, question around an element of the University of Pretoria that they. Uh, remember that comes to mind and all that and we've had interesting responses and uh, you'll find it quite interesting have a listen mm. my name is Dailo Mujapilu and when I think of the University of Pretoria the thing that comes to mind is success to be who you want to be my name is Nicole Varim when I think about the University of Pretoria I think about the massive impact that that had on my life and my career going forward Hello everyone, I am Shidupa Zomosida and when I think about UP, I think about Tribeca and the bird pizza. Hi, my name is Kreesan Pillay and when I think about the University of Pretoria, the thing that comes to mind is the amazing foundation it has given me to achieve my dreams. Hi, my name is Dion Shango and the first thing that comes to mind is academic excellence, a world-class institution and certainly a very welcoming and a very homely university. I'm Leandri van der Waart, and when I think of the University of Pretoria, the things that come to mind are Autumn campus and the smell of the laboratories. Hi, I'm Yvonne Dousop. Uh, when I think of the University of Pretoria, the thing that comes to mind is community and friendships. Prof, your thoughts uh, on all that? No, actually, yeah, well, I think the confirms what I think we are. So it's good to hear it from the alumni themselves. But I think everything mentioned by everybody there 
a test to what we aspire to be. It's good to hear that it's actually confirmed by the experiences of of people because it's a absolutely wonderful uh, institution. It's also the interesting thing about it is that it's a very large institution with many students. One of one of the universities with the largest enrollments, fifty six thousand this year. Sure. And so it could easily be just a sausage meal for degrees, but it's not a sausage meal for degrees. People find individual enjoyment and academic ful- fulfillment of their potential in there, which is good. Yeah. yeah, indeed. And also the infrastructure that is being built yeah, is absolutely. sensational. No, no. I was in France recently and I remember <laughs> this conference. Uh, so one of the panels, this, this student came up and set up there and started praising the University of Paris. She's a French student. She came to study here. And one of the things I, that struck me, she, talk, she spoke about the infrastructure, the sport, everything. I don't know that she's a sporting person herself, but she was doing a master's, I think, in international relations. And said she was better off having come to the University of Pretoria than just having stayed in France. Yeah, indeed. Mm-hmm. Prof, my final question to you, a lot of people, we spoke earlier, you mentioned about reflection, that being very important, but a lot of people around this time of the year will be taking stock of 2021 Mm. and will be thinking about, hey, I've got to jack it up, do better, go get it in 2022. Uh, Your words on how people can start 2022 strong, but not only start, but also finish the year strong. Mm. Well, I think to say that second year running, I mean, we have lost some people. And some people have been sick uh, with COVID and so on. But I think the large majority of us have lived through it, survived another year, found ways to be resilient. So, and that is something to celebrate. So people should, you know, once they take the pedal off the foot from the work, they should really rejoice and enjoy that they have, you know, if lived another year and not only live, but even some, where many thrived through these difficult circumstances that that resilience will carry us through 2022 and hopefully also 2022 is a better year, especially if all of us vaccinate and do not hesitate. And by 1 January, all vaccinated, then we're ready to come here and we can do more in-contact things without dropping the online things. Indeed. Professor Tawana Kupe, thank you so much for making time yet again and uh, always great to have a conversation with you. Thank you. Welcome and I hope you go and take the rest too. <laughs> Indeed, we'll uh, <laughs> take heed of that. Uh, that's the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, Professor Tawana Kupe. Well, there you have it. That's my conversation with the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, Professor Tawana Kupe. We spoke at length about many things, but a few things that stood out to me is the fact that you have to be making a difference. And indeed, you've got to prioritize rest to be effective. Remember to rate and review the podcast. You can subscribe on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. In actual fact, this is our final episode for the year 2021. It was a special edition for the Christmas and festive season. This podcast is proudly produced by the University of Pretoria's Alumni Relations Office. My name is Lennox Wasara. Our production team includes Samantha Castle, Alna Schutz. Our sound engineers are Louis Kluter Productions. Till we meet again, goodbye.